a pleasure to introduce our second speaker of this afternoon session in room C. It's Jochen Glück from, from the University of Passau. And he will talk about positivity properties of operator semigroups. So the stage is yours, Jochen. Thanks a lot, Christian, for your kind introduction. So yes, uh, I'm very glad to have you all here and I'm happy to, that you chose to attend my talk today. So um, when preparing the, the topic, I thought maybe I could give you an update about the most recent technical developments and long-time behavior of positive semi-groups. But then I thought, well, that would be great fun for me, but maybe not for you. So I chose to do something else. And I chose to give you a sightseeing tour through the world of positive semi-groups and I postponed the self-advertising of the newest results to the very end of the talk. So positive semi-groups on Banach spaces. What are we doing when we are discussing C0 semi-groups? We are discussing um, evolution equations. And in fact, linear autonomous evolution equations. So we have a semi-group generator A and a Banach space E. We're looking for a function U from the positive real axis into the Banach space, such that the derivative of u is a times u at each time. And we have an initial value u naught. Okay, that's what we all know if you're in the same group conference here. And yes, a is a generator, it's a closed operator on the Banach space. And now the slide here is about uh, evolution equations that preserve positivity. So what I want to do is I want to first um, re rediscuss three classical examples with you of uh, semi-groups. And then we come to the issue why positivity is interesting. So first of all, the heat equation on RD. Let us consider the Banach space of P over RD. Let's say P is not infinity. And let us consider the heat equation. So uh, looking for a function from uh, the real uh, positive real line into RD, such that the derivative of the function is Laplace of the function, yeah, the spatial Laplace operator. And well, we should define a, a domain of the Laplace operator. So that's in general the distributional domain. So it's the set of all functions f in LP such that the distributional Laplace operator is again LP. And if P is not one, then you can use elliptic regularity and then that's just W2P, circular space. So this is the heat equation. It's a very classic equation. It's solved by uh, the convolution with the Gaussian kernel. One of the most classical evolution equations. A second one is a transport equation. So a very simple one, I'll just make very simple examples at the beginning. So again, let us consider LP maybe now on the real line, P is not infinity, and let us consider the transport equation. Though the temporal derivative of our wanted function U is just the same as the spatial derivative, derivative d, dx of U. Again, we have an initial value. And this operator ddx is defined on the Zobolev space w1p, now first order Zobolev space. Now, this is also solved by the semi group, as we know, solved by the left shift semi group on LP of the real line. Yeah? So I have plus ddx here, so it's the left shift semi group, if I have minus ddx, it's the right shift semi group. Okay, that describes a very, very simple transport process, just the easiest example. And the third one is uh, something on a sequence space. So let's consider L infinity of N naught. So N naught is the index set here. And I want to consider an evolution equation with a bounded generator. So I'm going to do this, this U of T is again a vector in L infinity for each time T. So it has uh, components U naught T, U one T, U two T and so on. And the evolution equation should be the kth component of U, the derivative should be uh, minus UK. Of t. So plus the next entry of the vector uk plus one of t. And so you can write this as a matrix equation with an infinite matrix. So u dot t is a matrix A, the generator, times u of t. And the matrix is simple. So the matrix has a lot of zero entries. And then on the diagonal of the matrix, there's always minus one. And on the first super diagonal of the matrix, there's the number one always, right? So that's a bounded operator in L infinity, and uh, all off diagonal entries are one or zero, and all diagonal entries are minus one. And you can even check that the constant one sequence is in the kernel of the generator. 
then you can see that the adjoint or the pre adjoint of this generator has something to do with Markov processes. That's just, just a side note. So here the generator is bounded. Okay, now why did I mention those three examples? Well, first of all, they are prototype examples for very general, very general uh, illusion equations. The Laplace or the, the heat equation is a prototype example for a parabolic equation. And there are much more general parabolic equations. The transport equation or the shift semigroup is a prototypical, prototypical example for instance of Koopman semigroups and transport semigroups in more general situations. And this example here, the sequence space, is a prototypical example for, a, let's say, Markov, the dual, the dual semigroups of Markov processes yeah, on sequence spaces. So if a Markov process on a countable space, then actually um, you can always describe it by Markov semigroup on L1 and the dual semigroup X and L infinity. And what do they all have in common? All these examples, all these examples, well, they're defined on a function space, and every function space carries an order structure by comparing pointwise almost everywhere. And all those solution semigroups preserve positivity of the initial datum. So if you're not, the initial value is positive, then there is the solution for every subsequent time. Now that's true for the heat equation, that's true for the transport equation, and that's true in the last example on the sequence space because. On the diagonal, there are negative entries, but on the off diagonal, the off diagonal entries of the matrix are non negative. Then you can prove that the matrix preserves, the semi group preserves the order structure. Okay, so that's three very simple prototypical examples which motivate why we could be interested in positive semi groups. Here's the abstract setting. Well, how do we do it in general? Well, we need some space with an order structure, let us say a final lattice. Banach letters are very nice. If you don't know what a Banach lattice is, here are just a few examples. Your favorite LP space is a Banach lattice. Your favorite space of continuous functions is a Banach lattice. For instance, here K is a compact Hausdorff space. C of K is uh, meant to be the space of all scalar valued continuous functions. Okay, that's a Banach lattice with pointwise order and supremum norm. Bit more generally, if L is a locally compact Hausdorff space and you take the functions C not of L, which vanish at infinity, yeah, it's also Banach lattice. And you can find many more Banach lattices, but those are the most classical examples. So if you don't know what a Banach lattice is, just think of those three spaces as prototypes, yes. blueprints. What is a positive semigroup now? Well, A is a zero semigroup, generator A, and a, on this Banach lattice E is called positive. Simply, if each operator the same group is positive. In other words, this means whenever I have a positive initial value e in the function space around the Banach lattice, then the orbit is positive for each subsequent time t. So that's a positive semi group. Okay. If you don't know if the semi group is positive, you can, for instance, check it by considering the resolvent of the generator. So a given the zero semi group is positive if and only if the resolvent operator is positive. If you're on the right of the real line for sufficiently large lambda the operator should be positive. That's equivalent, which is an easy consequence of the Laplace transform formula for the resolvent and of the Euler formula for the semi group. Okay, now if you, that's just a definition. Yeah? Now, if you want to read up on those, there's a lot of theory about positive semi groups. You can have a look at the classical reference uh, in, uh, not in, in the, the book edited by uh, Rainer Nagel. Uh, one parameter semi of positive operators, bring a lecture notes from 86. Or in the more recent book by Andra Spartkai and uh, Marieta Kramar, uh, who is, I think, in the audience, and also Abdelaziz Zisrandi a few years ago, who uh, wrote a book about positive semi groups with a lot of applications in it. Now, before I go ahead, I should mention one more thing. You might be interested in spaces which are not lattices. For instance, if you do mathematical physics, could be interested in the self adjoint part of the star algebra, which is not a lattice unless the algebra is commutative. So we need more general order Banach spaces in some cases. So if you're interested in this, I can recommend you very warmly a classical article by Charles Batty and Eric Robinson. I think Charles is also in the audience from 1948, where they discussed it in a more general context positivity on order Banach spaces. Okay, so that's the introduction. And now, I just give you motivation and a few notions. 
Now I want to tell you something interesting about positive semigroups apart from the definition. If you, well, well I am always interested in the long-term behavior of the, solution, of the solutions to evolution equations. Yeah? And the long-term behavior of such semigroups is closely related to the spectrum of the generator. So I'm um, interested in large time and that's in the spectrum. So my next slide is time and spectrum. And that's interesting for positive semigroups because you might know the Perron Frobenius theorem for positive matrices. And there's something very similar for a positive operator semigroups. So here's the setting. Let us consider a positive semigroup on our bottom letter C. And to keep things less complicated, let's assume that it is bounded. So the operator norms are uniformly bounded for all times. That's the assumption. Now here's a wonderful, beautiful result by um, Gereiner, which is called Perron Frobenius type result the cyclicity of the peripheral spectrum. So our semi group is bounded. This means the spectrum is in the left half plane. Yeah. No spectral value has strictly positive real part. Let's look at the, um, let's say, let's call it boundary spectrum. What happens on the imaginary axis to the spectrum? Well, this boundary spectrum is uh, either empty, if the spectral bound is negative, or if the spectral bound is zero, then it is non-empty and then it is cyclic. What do you mean by cyclic? I mean the following property. Whenever I have, uh, let's say, a purely imaginary number, I beta, in the intersection of the spectrum and the imaginary axis, then every integer multiple of this number is again in the spectrum. Well, that's automatic. And that's a consequence of two things, the positivity of the semigroup and the lattice structure of E. This is not true on general ordered Banach lattices. I'm uh, sorry, on general ordered Banach spaces, that's false. But on Banach lattices, it's true. That's cyclicity. Okay. Now, this is a beautiful result. But apart from being beautiful, maybe it is also useful. And here is an example of why it is useful corollary. Many semi groups and applications are eventually norm continuous. Now, uh, for eventually norm continuous, we have additional information. Of the spectrum, namely, if we intersect the spectrum of A with a bounded vertical strip in the uh, complex plane, then this intersection is always bounded. That's a general fact about eventually non continuous semigroups. In particular, the set here, I hope you can see my mouse, the set here is bounded for eventually non continuous semigroup. But if you take a non zero number there, then all multiples are again in the set, or integer multiples which contradicts the boundedness. Yeah. So this means if you have eventual norm continuity, this intersection of the spectrum of the imaginary axis actually has to be zero, cannot be non-trivial. Oh, now that's a typo. This should be a subset sign here, not equality. Of course, it can be empty if the spectral bound is negative, it can be empty. Okay, and why is this interesting? Well, if this set is zero, and for instance, the semi group is also mean narcotic, which is just as an example true in every reflexive space, that's automatically true since they're semi group bounded, then we can apply, let's say, Tauberian theorems and get strong convergence of the semi group as time gets infinite. So this means eventual norm continuity together with positivity yields strong convergence, let's say on reflexive spaces, without ever computing the spectrum. Now we don't have to compute the spectrum. That's the point here. And uh, one remark, and so how, how precisely do we obtain strong convergence? Well, if you want to use, say, a bit of an overkill argument, you can refer to the uh, ABLV theorem, which was proved by uh, Wolfgang Arendt and uh, Charles Betty, which were both here, 1988. And also independently by Lubitsch and Wu, Studio Mathematica, also 1988. So that's in the theorem for semi groups. You can apply it in the situation to obtain the strong convergence from the mean ergodicity and the spectral condition. May I please ask a question? Please. I'm not familiar with, uh, uh, with these notions. Uh, it strongly converges uh, to zero or to... to. To an operator, just to an operator. So okay. for, for every x in E, E to the TA times x converges in norm on E, as T tends to infinity. It's convergence to an operator. But you can prove that in this case, the limit operator is automatically a projection. 
That's true. Okay. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Okay. So this is this convergence here. Okay. That's an application of Perron for Venus. Now, maybe something a bit more recent. Let's say we are again interested in strong convergence as time tends to infinity, but maybe we do not want to care about the spectrum for some reasons. So beyond spectral theory, here's another theorem about the long-term behavior. Just for the sake of simplicity, let's consider LP. Let's say P is not infinity, okay? LP, P is not infinity. Or if you, if you like abstract nonsense, you can say Banach lattice with order continuous norm, just as the job as well. And just as on the previous line, we have positive zero semi group, which we assume to be bounded. Now, here's a theorem. We assume the following things. First of all, the semi group should be reducible. So I'm not going to define, to define what this means, but you can think about it in the following way. Whenever you start with a non zero positive function and then apply the semi group, time runs and runs and runs, then you're going to uh, pass every point in the space. So if you, no matter where you start with your initial value, the orbit somehow uh, covers in a sense the entire space. That's the intuitive notion of irreducibility. Can make it precise, but that's not the problem here. Assume that it has a fixed point, uh, which is strongly positive. By this sign, I mean strongly positive. What does this mean? Well, if you think on LP over a sigma finite measure space, it just means that this function we not is strictly positive almost everywhere, almost everywhere. You can also define what this means on uh, general Banach lattices, but that's just abstract again. Just think of OP. And now the interesting point, point and uh, I think if you uh, listened maybe to the talk of Richard Rudnitsky this week, um, he might have also mentioned this. Partial integral operators are interesting. So we assume that the semi group contains a partial integral operator, which means the following thing. There is a time t naught, and there is an integral operator g, uh, j, which is not zero, j is not zero, such that j is sandwiched between zero and the semi group operator at time t naught. Okay. That's a partial. This means that e to the t naught a is a partial integral operator because there's an integral part beyond it, which is not zero, yeah, not beyond it, below it which is not zero. If you wonder what is an integral operator, it simply means J can be represented by an integral kernel. That's an integral kernel, you can write down the action of J as an integral kernel. Okay, and if this is satisfied, then the semi group converges strongly as time can still finish. Okay, now this is nice because uh, it was a nice opportunity to tell you a few remarks about how this theorem developed. So first of all, the first version of this theorem I'm aware of was when e to the ta is not a partial integral operator, but an integral operator. Yeah, if it's an integral operator, then this was essentially, this was actually proved by Greiner in 1982. It's a very classical paper of Greiner. And there were a few later papers by Davis and Vera Kaicher, who's a PhD student of Ivan Agel, and uh, they considered the result again on, uh, on the sequence spaces with different proofs. And Wolfgang Arendt, who's also here, uh, wrote a nice uh, article where he reproved the result and gave a nice uh, application to parabolic equations on rough domains. So the point about parabolic equations is that the semigroup, uh, the semigroup operators are, um, they are all integral operators as a consequence of, let's say, classical smoothing results for partial differential equations. So you can apply this. So this is for the case of integral operators, but now we have a more general case where it's only partial integral operators. Now, I'm not sure whether uh, Richard Rudnitsky is here today, but uh, for partial integral operators, in the case P was one. This was proved by Katarzyna Pichor and Richard Rudnitsky in 2000, with uh, particular applications in mind. So this case, where we have a partial integral operator on an L1 space occurs very, very frequently in mathematical biology. This happens very often. For instance, if you have a semi-group generator and perturb it by an integral operator, then you can use the Dyson-Phillips formula 
for the perturbed semigroup and get that the perturbed semigroup contains a partial integral operator. And uh, in a very general case, you was proved by Moritz Gerlach in Ulm 2013. Now, why beyond spectral theory? What's the benefit of going beyond spectral theory? So you, the spectrum is not mentioned here. Yeah. Well, one interesting thing is if you not don't care about spectrum, then we can also get rid of the generator. So here's a generalization. And the, let's say the light motive of the generalization is forget about strong continuity. So we also consider C0 semigroups here. We always consider C0 semigroups. But let us do the following. Let us take our C0 semigroup e to the dA and replace it with a semigroup. Let's call it TT, which has the same properties, but which is not assumed to be strongly continuous. So it's just an algebraic semigroup. Yeah? Everything else is defined in the same way. And now the result is this theorem remains true. You just don't need strong continuity, but you can't use the spectrum of the generator to prove it because there is no generator for a semigroup without strong continuity, right? So you need something completely else, and you can try to use a Jakob de Glicksberg theory. And then the point is you can't use the topological properties of the real line either because you have no connection to the topology of the real line. So you need to use algebraic properties of the real line. The point is that. Uh, the positive real numbers are divisible semigroup. That's what we need here. And then we can prove this. Okay. Now, well, proofs are by Moritz Gerlach, myself, 2019. And uh, together with Markus Hase, who is also here today, uh, we managed to put this in a more general context, give a more conceptual proof, also 2019. What's the benefit of it? Well, if you consider parabolic equations on RD with unbounded coefficients. You can often still prove some kind of generation result, but it's not going to be strongly continuous, the same group you obtain. Yeah? And then you can use results of this kind uh, to prove convergence results to equilibrium as time tends to infinity. This was by Moritz and uh, Markus Gunze, I think who was here yesterday, 2020. And a bit more self-advertising, if you're not interested in strong convergence, but in operator non-convergence, you can do similar things to, for instance, by Ali Sobrik, who's also here today. And uh, we, go, we proved similar results, not precisely the same, but something similar for operator non-convergence. Okay, so I'm almost done, but I promise you um, one more thing in the abstract, namely, we were discussing, been discussing positive semigroups all the time. Now, here's something strange, but you might have heard the word, word already on this conference. Eventual positivity, which is, in other words, positivity for large times. Now, uh, what the hell is this? Strange things do happen. I have an example for you. On the space L2 on the unit interval, let us consider the Laplace operator A, which maps U to its second derivative. Now, that's obviously a very well studied operator. So what would be interesting about it? Well, what's interesting is the boundary conditions which I impose here. So on the domain of A, I impose non-local boundary conditions. I say uh, here, those are minus the, uh, minus the normal derivatives at the boundary points, and they should be equal to um, the sum of the function on both boundary points. Now that, that's, Laplace operator, but with non-local boundary conditions. And now you can indeed prove, you, so first of all, you can check whether the semi-group generated by it is positive. No, it's not positive. You can do it by um, using the form, the bilinear form, with a, which is associated to A, then use the burning denis criterion, and then you see it's not positive, the semi-group. But, that's funny, it's positive for all sufficiently large times. So if you start with a positive initial value, it can happen that the, the function, the solution changes sign for small times, but then after some time it gets back to the positive cone and it stays there. And no matter with which positive initial datum you start, you always end up in the positive cone. And you find a fixed time T naught from which on this happens, no matter what is your initial value. That's the observation here. Now, that's kind of strange, I think at least if you're not used to it. 
So conceptual explanation would be nice and also an explanation of how one can prove this. Non-positivity follows from the berlin denis criterion, but positivity for large time, how to prove it? Here is one theorem, and it's just a very simplified example to state it in a very concise manner. More general things are known. This is due to Daniel Danners and myself. Let us consider, just as setting above, a finite measure space, an L2 space on the finite measure space, and a self adjoint semigroup. So there are non self adjoint versions of the result, but self adjoint is easy to state. I assume two things. I assume a smoothing property that at some time T naught, the semigroup smooths L2 into L infinity, which means that all peaks and all singularities of initial values are smoothed out, right? Everything is bounded after I apply the dynamics. And I have a second spectral assumption, which might remind you of the Perron Frobenius theorem. I assume that the spectral bound of A, so this is the largest spectral value, I assume that the largest spectral value S of A is an eigenvalue, in brackets, which is automatic here, but it doesn't matter, is an eigenvalue. And I assume that it's a simple eigenvalue. So it's spent by one function, W, and I assume that W is strongly positive in, in the following sense, it's bounded away from zero. So it dominates a multiple of the constant one factor. Okay. This happens sometimes. And if this happens, then one can indeed show using a bit of operator and spectral theory, that the same group is positive for large times. Yeah, that's the result here. And you can apply, apply, can apply to this example. You can show, that's not completely true, but you can show that in this example, the assumptions are satisfied, and then you get eventual positivity. Okay. Um, there are a lot of more examples. That's well, just a toy example here. Yeah, there are <laughs> maybe these come yeah. to an end in a few. Yeah. In, in maybe one minute. Yeah, don't need a, I didn't, don't need a minute, 30 seconds. Um, Thank you. A lot more theorems. Uh, for instance, basic theory about eventual positivity by Daniel Danos and James Kennedy. More interesting, you might have heard two talks by uh, Zaheba Arora and uh, Jonathan Mui on this conference who proved more recent results on eventual positivity. You can find applications on eventual positivity in various PDs, so for instance, uh, Federico Gregoria and Nadine Gorio and David Mungelo proved, no, that's not 2000, that's 2020, eventual positivity for, um, let's say, uh, semi groups on graphs. And also in this conference, uh, David Floss gave a talk about, uh, where he mentioned at the end, eventual positivity of uh, bi Laplace operators with Benson boundary conditions. So that's everything I wanted to say. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Jochen, and sorry for the uh, small interruption at the end. <laughs> Everything's fine. I think we have time for one question, and I would uh, say if there is there is room uh, of discussion afterwards, because the third speaker will not be there. So, if you want to change to another room, you can it now or after the, the question, or you can stay here to, to discuss with the previous speakers. I have so probably any... a simple question. Uh, it is possible to generalize this theorem about asymptotic stability to eventually positive semigroups? Good question. So we have proved, so there, there is a recent preprint by uh, Zaheba, who's also here and myself, about such results, you can prove many results about long term behavior of positive semi groups, also for eventual positive semi groups, sometimes by different methods. I am not sure whether, uh, put it here, I am not sure whether this result holds for eventually positive semi groups. I really don't know. <laughs> but it's, results based on spectral theory often also hold for eventual positive semi groups. Okay. Thank you. I would have a question, if I may. Please. Uh, concerning the example that you have shown on, I think it was almost the last slide, 
uh, yeah, that one with strange boundary condition. And of course you knew that I would ask about this. Um, <clears throat> there are examples of, um, of this type uh, in which one, um, one end of the interval is a kind of, is, is an end where uh, you lose some particles mm -hmm. and on the other hand, you gain some, art, some particles. Mm -hmm. And then uh, you may have some kind of balance or so. Is it a similar example? Like, is it a, a kind of similar phenomenon here? How, how would you, I mean, I'm, I'm of course looking for a kind of stochastic explanation for this. So uh, in general, one comment is to really give a stochastic explanation might be difficult because you don't have positivity, right? So probability measures are not preserved. But in general, so the reason why we consider this particular boundary example is that the bilinear form associated with the operator is very simple. So it's the, the standard en energy form on H1 plus a boundary term and the matrix of the boundary term is one, 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 one. And this is somehow really simple. Um, three few years ago, we had a simulation for this where you could, can, could see what happens and could try to interpret it stochastically, but I can't find it anymore. Uh, I'm really not sure how to interpret it. I tried it a few times. Let me just say it's strange. Okay, yeah, that's, that's, that's true. That's definitely strange. <laughs> Okay, thank you. Uh, let us uh, thank the speaker again. Thank you, Jochen, for the nice talk. And for those who uh, have questions, comments, and remarks from the previous uh, talks, they may stay here. And otherwise, you're